I mean, well, I really think that at the root of it, it just, it stems from this fear of not being accepted. Um, and this fear of not being understood and of not belonging. And so because we don't want to have that happen, then, you know, we mask it with perfectionism. We mask it with resistance. Um, and you know, we'll even mask it. You know, one of the biggest things that I see for artists is like, you know, they'll be like, well, I don't have to worry about marketing myself. Like I'm the artist. Welcome to Tried and True with a Dash of Woo, where we're all about mixing tried and true strategies that actually work with the magic of manifestation and the science of programming your unconscious mind so that you walk away feeling integrated, inspired, and aligned. I'm Renee Bowen, certified life and business coach, professional photographer, middle-aged wife, and mom to now three grown kids. I've built two multiple six-figure businesses with zero business training by digging in, learning the methods, and now I'm here to pass them all on to you. From photography and business strategies to energy healing, human design, and the basics of manifestation, we cover it all here. I'm here to help you embrace your multi-passionate brains and lean in to the fastest and most efficient ways to reach your goals, whatever they may be. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, or maybe you're just here for the woo-woo, let's dive in and explore all the exciting ways to take your life, business, and self-improvement to the next level. Thanks for joining me and get ready to be inspired. Y'all, I am so excited about today's show. I have Julie Solomon here with us today. You're going to love this conversation. Julie is a speaker, a business coach, host of the Top Rated, the Influencer Podcast, and author of a best-selling book now. It's been almost a year that it's been out called Get What You Want, How to Go from Unseen to Unstoppable. And she's a pro at teaching people how to do that. I was lucky enough to be inside of her mastermind in 2021. She spent over a decade helping people align their purpose with their vision and to find out what makes them shine while confidently sharing it with the world. So you better believe we dive into that topic. And we talk all about how creatives can step into their awesomeness and learn how to show up for their business and market for their business. She's the perfect melding of the woo and the strategy, and you are going to get a lot from this conversation. So let's get into it. So hello, Julie. Thank you so much for being here. It is always so good to see you. Ah, it's so good to see you. I wish I got to to do it more in person because I adore you. I love you. I love your energy. You just always um, put me in a better space and place when I'm around you. So I love it. I love our time oh. together. Well, the feeling is 100% mutual. Trust me. So yes, but hopefully some, sometime soon we'll be able to see each other in person. So can I just dive right into your brain for a second? I wanted to, you know, I usually sort of wait to ask this question until a little bit later, but because of the title of the podcast, I really like to just ask my guests what their take on the woo is, right? Like, so how woo are you? You know, what are some of your favorite woo modalities that people may not know? that you love? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm more than a dabbler for sure. Um, I wouldn't say I'm fully in like the 12 feet of deep, but probably like the eight feet of deepness in, in the woo pool. Um, for me, you know, well, and first just, just, uh, faith and spirituality and prayer and, and having a conscious relationship with a higher source has always been a part of my life. I was raised in a more traditional, you know, religion. Um, and, but I, I'm actually so thankful for that because it gave me this foundation for understanding faith in a way that I don't know if I would have, or I I might've had a harder Mm -hmm. time with that as I got older. So I, I love that I, that my foundation is rooted there. Um, I don't practice, uh, you know, any kind of more formalized, uh, religion now as an adult. Um, 
but I, I am with the woo of connection to source and spirituality. And so how I do that is through meditation. I love Oracle uh, decks. I have a ton of them that I use and I will pull sometimes daily, um, weekly, monthly. I've got a whole meditation prayer altar with all the peeps from every religion <laughs> that you can imagine. <laughs> You've got the Buddha, the cross, all the things over there, all of my crystals. I'm really big into crystals as well, as well um, mandalas. Um, I love, uh, also candles and saging and essential oils and just anything that's going to get me into that space of feeling connected, um, is super important to me. And so I do a lot of that in terms of a daily practice. And then I also, to me, it kind of feels woo. I don't know if it's woo for, for, for other people, but it's, it's part of my meditation where I go in and I'll do the binaural beats, which I know Renee that you know all about and, um, really diving into that a, a couple of years ago was really awesome too. And I love just to listen and I'll be sitting and it kind of just, if, if I can, if I can quiet my mind enough, like it will take you, like I will see things like it's, mm-hmm. it can, it can take you places. And, and I love that. And just the sense of clarity and peace and like release that I have from that. And so that's really how my woo looks like day to day. I've also done, um, a lot of medicinal experiences. I've done, lots of journeys with psychedelics throughout my adulthood. I did a lot actually in my twenties that weren't really medicinal, but they were a lot of fun. (laughs) Um, but as I got older, I see the value in those things. Um, Uh and I've, I've done a lot of retreats, um, mindfulness retreats and, um, you know, anything that I can to kind of set the tone is important to me. So that's kind of what my, my woo journey looks like. I love that. And I love, we have a lot in common just across the board. Just, you know, you, you guys will understand as this conversation goes further, but that's one of them is that I also was brought up really, I mean, I was brought up Catholic. I went to a Catholic school, you know, for 13 years and I don't practice that necessarily right now, but that foundation it gave me, it's really interesting that I didn't even realize, and I don't know if this happened with you as well, but I didn't realize how much it sort of affected me until I was really an adult, because I feel like I kind of spent a lot of my late teens and much of my twenties really rebelling against it and trying to create space between it because I was really drawn to the more new age, I guess, spiritual thought patterns, right. In my twenties, like, you know, in the early nineties and I was in LA, so it was a perfect, you know, breeding ground for that. But my husband made a point to me not too long ago. And he said, he said, because, you know, he's never made any qualms about the fact that he's dealt with depression for much of his life. And I really had like, I've had spurts, but I'm not, not in that way. And I was mentioning how, you know, every morning I just, I wake up. One of the first things I think is I'm just like, so happy to be alive. I'm so grateful that I survived the night because I feel like as a child growing up very Catholic, well, that was one of the things like, you were taught like you could die in your sleep and this could be, you know, this could be your last day. So you need to be grateful. And when I was younger, I looked at it as such a very negative thing. But as an adult, I was like, wow, he goes, that actually really gave you like a basis of gratefulness that was a byproduct of just so happy to be alive and to be awake and to have a new day. And so when you look at it from that perspective and shift it, it's like, wow, I'm so glad that I had that baseline of gratefulness because the gratefulness is such a huge precursor to everything. I feel like in good in your life and getting what you want, which is the name of Julie's book. And we'll, we'll start sort of diving into that, but I love hearing about everyone else's woo practice and to see sort of like on the scale of where they are. And you are very much also, I feel like, um, this really great combination of tried and true strategies with the woo and the mindset, because you know, the importance of both of those facets, um, that we need to integrate a lot of those. And so you do talk a lot about strategies, obviously, and you work with a lot of female entrepreneurs. And one of the questions I wanted to sort of dive in today with you is, why do you think it's so hard for women, especially? Because I see this a lot in my communities um, with creatives. Why do you think it's so difficult for, for us to show up for ourselves, 
to be our own PR agent, as you talk about in the book, um, to really step into that visibility. Why do you think that is? And, and how can we, how can we move through it? I mean, well, I really think that at the root of it, it just, it stems from this fear of not being accepted. Um, and this fear of not being understood and of not belonging. And so because we don't want to have that happen, then, you know, we mask it with perfectionism. We mask it with resistance. um, And, you know, we'll even mask it. You know, one of the biggest things that I see for artists is like, you know, they'll be like, well, I don't have to worry about marketing myself. Like I'm the artist. Like I just, Mm -hmm. I just need to stay here and be the artist. And that's going to be someone else's job, which it's probably like the most arrogant thing that anyone could ever say (laughs) because, you know, who are you to think that like, it's not your job to show the world who you are. Like you're, you're just going to like give that to someone else. It's no one else's job. No one's coming to save you. No one's coming to like give you your marketing on a platter. And I, and I think that even if that's what we were sold at one point in time, it's just not true. And I think there's a difference between, creating for the sake of creating, which comes from source. And like, no one can ever take that away from someone. I feel, I I believe every single human being on this planet is an artist. Now, whether they actually ever step into that or cultivate that or call that in, maybe it's not part of the contract in this lifetime. But if you're, if you're a live, a living, breathing entity on this planet, you're, you're an artist and we all have a part to play in how that flows out. Um, But when people started seeing that you could take art and you can make money off of it and market art, well, that's a completely different kind of beast. And so I think that people first have to get clear on, am I, do I want to create art and actually make a living from it? Or am I just creating art for the sake of creating art? And if you're someone who's saying to yourself, I want to create art and make a living from it, then it is 110% your job to not only create said art, but to also market said art. And there's just no way of getting around that because no one is ever going to be able to message and market yourself better than you. Now, you may not have the skill set yet, or you may not have refined it in the way that you want to yet, but that is, and maybe even one day you'll be, you know, a gazillionaire and you'll have this massive support of people, or maybe you don't even have to be a gazillionaire. Maybe one day you'll just hire an assistant to help you. But I still believe at the core, you have to conceptually understand how this works. And I feel like it's so easy for artists to kind of just like, as a form of resistance or a form of control or or a form of trying to avoid potentially the fear of failure or the fear of um, rejection they say, well, that's not my job. And because it's not my job, it's not my fault if it never happens. And then we get to mm-hmm. kind of deflect it off to other people. And so that's kind of my very layered way of how I look at that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, it's definitely something I see and I hear a lot. And I love in your book, the way that you sort of frame it as well, because you know, yeah, no one's coming to save you, but I, there's something that you say in there and I'm paraphrasing, but it's to the fact of so many people who, who, you know, whenever they get into business, they decide to monetize something that they happen to be good at and, and really enjoy doing. And then they start to understand that, okay, they have to monetize it. And that becomes really scary. And they think that it'll just magically, someone will magically step in to become that PR agent or many of, you know, many people will do that for you. And I, I see that happen a lot with the photographer community as well, because, you know, they feel like, well, why am I not getting clients? And I'm the first question I ask is like, well, what have you done to market? And more Mm -hmm. often than not, it's not very much. And they sort of expect their circle of friends their either past clients or anyone that they've worked with to do that marketing for them. But they don't understand how to actually make those happen with strategies. And so it is, it becomes very easy for them to just write it off and say, um, it's someone else's fault. It's the market's fault. This is something I hear often and you probably do too, that the market is too saturated. There's too many photographers. There's too many makeup artists. There's too many hairstylists. There's too many, this, there's too many influencers, whatever it is. 
And I, that conversation I think is, is just so, <laughs> it definitely, it definitely fires me up, you know, <laughs> but what would you say to someone who comes to you and says that, well, Julie, the market is just too saturated. You know, I've tried, but there's too many of us. That's why I can't make any money. Yeah. I mean, my first question would be like, okay, so how does that thought get you what you want? That would just be my first question. Like how, yep. how does that belief that you have, how is that getting you closer to the end goal, right? To the end result? Well, it's not. Um, but really it's about like, cause a lot of times we psychologically need evidence to prove the thought, to, to justify the thought. So I would say, well, let's look at the evidence of how that's not true. I mean, even look at like um, Tesla, for example, when the Tesla car company came out, how many cars were on the road? Millions. I mean, how, how many mm -hmm. car companies had already been established? Thousands. <laughs> But, you know, not only did Tesla come out, but Tesla then revolutionized the entire car industry. Now, say what you exactly. want about the founder of Tesla. <laughs> but, you know, an example like that just goes to show that, you know, if he would have believed that very scarce thought, like he would have never gone on to revolutionize an entire industry that had been around forever that was actually a really massive ship to try to turn around. Um, you know, I even think about, you know, my early days as a book publicist, I remember when audiobooks, you know, were kind of coming out and people would kind of balk at it. They're like, you know, that's never really going to be a thing. And, and books on tape never really took off that well, you know, every, it, the, the, the book in hand is always going to be the big thing. Well, then here comes Audible. And if it wasn't for Audible doing what they did, you wouldn't even have a ton of people that now love, they call themselves book, book readers, even though they're book listeners, that now get to listen to book and actually get to absorb the information because it's being delivered to them in a way that they want to consume it. And so I think that it's just about, yes, we can sit here and chalk up a ton of evidence about why we think that the market is too saturated, but there's also evidence to contradict that as well. And I think it just really comes down to the idea of what do you want to choose to believe? Because there's one, you have kind of a few choices, but that this all or nothing binary thinking is not going to get you anywhere. So how can we stay open and curious? And I think it's even to add to that, it's not just about to like the oversaturation, but even when even when something may not appear to be saturated, and I'll give you an example. There, there was a guy that was uh, that had sold out the the arena at you know a, a nineteen thousand seat arena in Nashville a couple of weeks ago. It was a comedian, and I kept seeing all these posts of people being at this show, and I'm sitting here thinking like. Who is this guy? Who are like who are who are these people going to see? And it was like, oh, he's sold out. This is gonna be amazing. This guy's amazing. And I was so confused because I had no clue who they were talking about. And they were talking about this comedian named Nate Bargazzi, who's not only a very well-known comedian, he had a Netflix comedy show. Like he's massive. And I had no flipping idea who he was. And I remember thinking like, how is, how bizarre is it that someone can be so quote unquote known and still be so completely unknown to me? And even though the market is saturated, even though this, even though that, that I think that just goes to show you how much more we need to market ourselves than we even think we need to market ourselves. And sitting back and just saying, oh, it's too saturated is not getting you closer to what you want. And so you have to get over that excuse so you can actually start creating some change that is going to get you closer to that and to really start to build the awareness. And it's not, it's not crazy things that you have to do. There's really simple things, especially for photographers that you could do online every day. You could, you know, reintroduce yourself to your community, tell them who you are and what you do and how you serve. And, you know, typically what kind of clients do you work with and, and why do you work with those type of clients? You could compile a list of the most common questions that you receive from clients and you can answer them. You can write about why you started a photography business and what was that journey for you? Um, personal stories always lend to more connection. I mean, there's so many ways and little things that we can do um, 
just even everyday occurrences. I mean, just that silly story about Nate Bargatze is just like this everyday occurrence in my life that came. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating to me that this person is so well known in certain, in a certain space, but yet I have no idea who he is. And, and, and isn't that interesting? And, and what does that mean when it comes to branding and visibility? And so saturation, smasheration, I mean, it's, you know, it, mm-hmm. like, Yes and no. It's completely irrelevant to me, to be honest, the saturation piece. Yeah, I get that. Um, I always tell people too, and it's really interesting that you said that um, because people do find proof of whatever they're looking for, whatever that is. I mean, it's just, it's part of our neurological makeup. What is it? The the um, reticular activating system in the brain. So if you want to get technical, it's not even a woo-woo thing. That's literally part of our brain. Like we're wired to look for the red car. If someone tells you, look for the red car, you you know, you're going to find way more than you would on, on the daily because you're looking for it. And so you're going to find proof of whatever it is that you believe. And if you believe the market is saturated, you're going to find so much proof to back that up. And if you look for proof, on the other side of that, you will find that as well. So it is a decision that we need to make and daily. And that's the thing, right? So many people um, get into business, let's just say. I think it's really interesting too, that most of us who are creatives or drawn to you know, starting our own businesses and you also are an introvert. You mentioned that in your book. A lot of people may not know that about you, but I am as well. And a lot of us are. And so I think it's very interesting that we're drawn to these things that are going to push us and prompt us and challenge us to get out of our comfort zone because there's nothing good that happens there so that we have to do it, right? So I believe that that is a higher source, a higher power, or however you want to call it, that we are drawn to it for a reason and that It is then up to us whether we're going to show up or not and step into it or find proof of the fear, find proof of whatever it is you believe. And of course, we can also dive into the fact that that's also very limited, restricted, closed off thinking, which is the opposite of an abundant mindset, which is what I try to always Right. operate from and the opposite of creativity more than to be honest exactly right. because you can't you can't grow creativity by definition means that you know expansion and growth and and also the receiving of information and downloads and inspiration right you can't be inspired or creative when you're so closed off and so tightly wound to 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 think that there isn't enough for anyone And there's not enough money to go around and there's too many photographers and, you know, there, that's usually because you're competing on a low price, by the way, which is a whole different discussion, but that is part of it as well. And so I definitely, I definitely hope that, you know, you guys listening can, can take from that, that, that choice is yours. And there are things that you can do to set yourself up to get what you want, to have the kind of life that you want to live. But that does require, it does require some work on your part daily. And that is a lot of, that's a lot. You probably see the follow through on your end as well. You know, whether it be with your coaching students or in your communities, that's where I think a lot of people fall off. Why do you think that is? Why do you think people don't have the, I guess, I don't know, staying power is necessarily the right word, but that, that that consistency to continue to show up, you know, day after day, month after month, especially when it's hard. That's, that's so key. What do you think is sort of why people don't do that? I think it, it really comes down to their beliefs. I mean, some people can say, well, I don't have the energy to do it or I don't have the resilience or I'm just not made that way. But again, I, I think it comes from your core belief system and beliefs are just, thoughts that you continue to think over and over again. So you can actually change your beliefs. <laughs> um, and when you change your beliefs, that actually then changes your thoughts, which then changes your habits, which then changes what you work on, how you see the world, what you receive, what you give. It it, it starts with everything. And so to me, I believe it, it comes from that core belief system. And for running from a core ve- belief system that nothing ever works out for me, um, it happens for other people, but not for me. Who am I to do this? Who am I to think this? Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm supposed to just be a starving artist anyways, because I'm not supposed to make a lot of money off of my craft or, you know, like what, whatever is the payoff that you're getting, it it all stems from that belief system. And I think the more that we can, again, allow ourselves to be open and curious to different ways of thinking and different types of belief system and, and getting out of that all or nothing thinking and getting out of that superiority to inferiority thinking is that's really where the magic is. And, and I think that, you know, the people that I see who are the most successful and whatever that means for someone, cause it's all relative, but they really are just the ones who they just kept going and they just kept moving forward. It doesn't mean they're the most talented. It doesn't mean that they're the smartest or the prettiest or, you know, came from the right family or whatever you want to say. It, it, they just kept moving forward. And, and with that, they, because they're always focused in that, in that forward motion, they don't get so bogged down with the like, oh, you know, that, that one scarce belief of, oh, the market's too saturated or, oh, what if this doesn't work out? Or, oh, what if I fail? Or, oh, what if people think something about me? Because they're too busy moving forward. And so I I think that that's really, that's why people do it. And I think that that's the way out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that also too, and I know you are a big believer in this is having, you know, so thinking about some of the strategy part of it as well, right. Uh, bringing into some of that into the conversation. I know you're really big on having a formula or following someone's, you know, proven formula, right. Whether that be being in a mastermind with them or studying under them or coaching with them or coming up with your own through some of those processes. Um, Do you think that once people sort of adopt that strategy that tends to get them to, to leap bigger than maybe just on their own and that one of the strategies for that staying power is being surrounded by people who are also doing the same? A million percent. And I, you know, I even look at my own journey and it's whenever I have been the most quote unquote successful for what, you know, however I define that at the time, whatever the the goal was, it's when I, I made a decision to learn from someone who had successfully achieved what I was trying to achieve. And I literally did everything that they said to do. Now, of course, I would have my own nuances to things and my own flavors to things. And I, I can make things my own, but when it came to the core foundation of, if if they were like, if you want to do X, you need to do Y, I would do it. And that helped me immensely. And then having at the same time, if you can have a community of people around you who, who just get it, they get you, they get where you're going, they get where you're you're coming from. They get the triage moments, the challenges, all of those things, just that energy of support and accountability is always going to help you stay the path. I think it's when, you know, people may join groups or communities or sign up for things, or maybe hire a coach or something like that. And with this idea of like osmosis, right, Renee, it's like, I'm going to work with this person, but I don't really have to do anything. Like I'm just going to be in their energy. Mm -hmm. And then the manifestation of whatever I want is going to happen. And from my own experience as a student and as a coach, the time that I have seen when it, when it doesn't work for people is a twofold. If you're in an environment like this, when you don't show up and participate, you, you get what you get out of it. And if the leader or the coach or the person that you've hired to learn from tells you what to do, and then you don't do it, <laughs> then you're not going to get the success that you're looking for. And so to me, it, it really just comes down to, to that, to, to that simplicity of it. Now, I don't necessarily think that, that other people know what's best for you. I do believe that we also have our own, you know, our own gut, our own instincts, our own knowingness of knowing what's the best for us. But I also am a believer that if I am trusting this energetic exchange enough to invest in this person, to either invest money or my time or energy into learning for this person, and they tell me what to do, by gosh, I'm at least going to try it and just see, like, see how it lands, see how it feels. Did this feel on for me? Did it feel off for me? But I'm at least going to give it a go. Okay. Photographers, 
this message is for you. There's a lot of education in our industry, as I'm sure you know, but I do something a little differently with my group coaching program that I call Elevate. And I want to talk to you about it for a second because we are re-enrolling for this next round soon. It goes from July through December of this year. It's a six-month program. And when I tell you there's really nothing else like it, here's what I mean. Yes, we do have Zoom calls every month, and there's a portal of a lot of information for you online that we add to as well as our time together progresses. But what makes this really unique is, first of all, I am certified in life coaching, so We really do take into account the entire person that you are and not just the photographer that you are. So we talk about mindset, we talk about abundance, we talk about manifestation, and then we also absolutely talk about strategy and money and profit and making sure that you are running your business as efficiently as possible. So you get access to me via Voxer, which is a voice texting app, pretty much 24-7. I don't know any other photography educator out there who is this accessible to their coaching students. It's kind of unheard of, but here's the thing. I created this program and all my programs for the photographer that I once was, for that version of myself who really struggled and needed this so much, but couldn't find it. It didn't exist and it still kind of doesn't. So I created this and everything that I do for her and for you. So if you're looking for not just community and accountability, but also serious education and ongoing support and mindset from someone who's actually certified and understands how to pull out of you what you can't do on your own, then you need to go ahead and check out Elevate. Now, I don't know if I'm going to run this program ever again. I just have to be honest with you. I have done it now for the last three and a half years and I love it, but there could be some other things on my horizon. So I can't promise you that I will run it, especially in the same way that I'm running it now ever again. So if you've been on the fence and you need some coaching and you can't afford to jump into my one-on-one, this is for you. It's by application only. So you'll need to go ahead and hit the link in the show notes to do that. And then someone will get back to you and let you know if we think you're a good fit. And we may even have to hop on a quick call to double check. But I look forward to hearing from you and working with you to get you to build the most profitable and most fulfilling business that you possibly can. But it's the ones that resist that. Like I signed up with this coach and, you know, or I I got part of this community but then I never showed up or I didn't participate or I didn't do what they told me to do. And I'm stuck in the same place that I was in. And I don't know why it's like, well, you just gave me all the reasons why. <laughs> so I see yeah. that a lot. Yeah. I, I definitely do as well. I feel as though it's really easy to, and I don't want to make light of other people's circumstances, right? Like we all come from our own origin story. We talk about that a lot too. We all have our own origin story. We all have our own beliefs that come from that. And it's up to us whether we want to decide to continue to believe those or not going into adulthood. I do believe that. But I do feel as though it's very easy to come up with those types of excuses because that's kind of ultimately what it is. If you know you you have decided to put yourself in a situation where you're going to grow or you're, you know, you'd like to learn from these people or you want to come up with, you know, your own sort of formula. And so you want to learn from someone else. And then, like you said, you don't show up for it or you don't follow the advice. Either one of those things happen. It's really easy to then just find the proof of this excuse that, it just didn't work for me. That You know what I mean? For whatever reason. I feel like as a whole, probably, and that this is probably a different conversation too, but as a society, we probably aren't really great at taking personal responsibility at this point. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We love to deflect. We love to blame the other side. It's, it's always their fault. The problem's out there. And the more that we keep pointing outside of ourselves, the farther and more disconnected we get from, again, like what I think is our purpose and, and 
how we're moving forward. Um, mm-hmm. I always believe that we have a part to play in our victimhood circumstances, which are of course different than someone who's actually been a victim to something. Um, but if you are in your own perpetual state of suffering, um, you have a part to play in that. Even if it's 1%, you have a part to play in that. And that's where we have to start taking radical and personal accountability and really look at ourselves as to why am I here? Why am I choosing to believe the things that I'm believing? Do I, am I even conscious of, of realizing how it's actually creating the reality that I have that I say that I don't want? And, and how is that so? And, and what, cause I can't change other people, places and things I can sure blame them, but the only person that I can really change and, and somewhat control is myself. So that's where I think it really does begin and end with us. And, and that's why keeping the focus on yourself as being the change maker for what it is that you desire is everything. That's such a great reminder too. And you touched a little bit on purpose there, which you and I both, again, something we're very we have in common. Uh, it's one of the foundations of my coaching. I know it is for you as well, but I love how you also frame that a little bit in the book and, and in your speaking engagements and things about the difference between purpose and passion, because I feel like a lot of people muddle the two maybe, or maybe they just have their own interpretation, but I really love how you sort of position it and explain it, like the difference between purpose and passion and how they both can come into play in building a personal brand, which is what you are an expert in teaching people how to do. So tell us a little bit about your perspective on those. Yeah. You know, I mean, in the simplest fashion, I believe that your purpose is your why and your passion or passions are your what. So your purpose is why you wake up every day to do what it is that you do. It's that deeper connection to something greater than yourself. And your passions are all the things that you choose to do the what's to really activate and bring that why to life. Now, the beauty of that, if you can distinguish between the two, is that it kind of lets you a little bit off the hook with the passions, or at least allows you to just play and not be so sometimes detrimentally attached to your passions. Because I also believe that your passions should grow and evolve as you grow and evolve. You know, for example, I used to be passionate about playing the flute in my sixth grade, you know, band but I'm still not today, like trying to become, you know, a a world renowned flautist, you know, it's just like, but, and that's okay. Like that was a passion of mine, but it wasn't like why I wanted to do it. Like I loved playing the flute because, you know, it, 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 it brought something in me alive. And that, that was the deeper, the deeper thing there. It was a form of connection. And so, um, I think that if, if we can start to distinguish between the two, we can let ourselves off the hook more. We can have more fun. We can bring more joy into the work that we do and we can start taking more accountability and responsibility for, for, for the why and, and the deeper purpose of why we're here. Yeah. I lo- and also fun fact, I was also a flute player in middle school. So it's another thing it's amazing. that we have in common. Oh my goodness. So yeah, I think I see this a lot, you know, was one of the first things that I want to cover with my coaching students is for them to really highlight and uncover their purpose, their why. And usually the first thing that they say is, well, because I want to, and it always is related to photography in some way, if they're photographers or whatever their creative business is, they relate it to their business. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean, like outside of that. And that's, that's that, that distinction right there that you, you do so well to explain is that that's part of your passion. That's the, that's, that's the, what, that's the thing that they're going to get from you. That's what you're delivering. That's how you express it. But that's not why. In most cases, your why and your purpose has nothing really necessarily to do with what you do for a living or as your business even. And that's why it's, um, I think, so important to do that work with someone because it wasn't until mm-hmm. I worked with a coach on my work, my purpose and my why that I really was prompted enough 
to go deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Because when I really was able to step back and, and get a very different perspective from someone else and their prompts and their questions, that I was able to see that my why had really you know, on, on paper, not necessarily anything to do with photography, but the way I relate it to it has everything to do with it. And so I would really encourage anyone listening to do that work. It is, it is something that will serve you no matter what, even if you don't ever want to start a business or you don't have dreams of making millions of dollars, it is going to help you live a better life. You're going to be a better parent, a better partner, just a better person. You're going to have more of a fulfilled life when you really feel connected to your, your sense of purpose here. And I know you agree with yeah. that because <laughs> you talk yeah, about that a sure. lot. It's, I mean, it's <laughs> an entire, it's chapter four in my book. It's, it's a massive, a massive piece to, I think the success puzzle. For sure. For sure. And I think a lot of us women too, this is a very common thing that I hear. And I don't know if you dealt with this or not. I know I definitely did in, in different ways because I, you know, my kids are so much older now, but I hear a lot of female entrepreneurs, especially who are new moms or thinking about becoming new moms who have a business and running a business. And first of all, I think it's amazing that you're doing that because a lot of women don't ever even feel empowered enough to be able to do that and, you know, really come into their own financial greatness, let's just say, and, um, financial autonomy outside of their partner, which you and I also are really big believers on. But when that whole thing of motherhood comes in and family, so how did you navigate being the CEO of your business and, you know, having your business, how did you navigate that as you became a mother? Because I know that really messes with a lot of our identities. (laughs) Yeah. I think that, you know, it, it was a, it was an, it was an evolution of a really getting clear on where I needed help and support. I think there's this belief that we're supposed to like do it all ourselves, which is just completely Mm -hmm. erroneous and impossible. Um, so when I started to build and, you know, I got, I always feel, feel about anything this way. You're either spending time or you're spending money. And when I got to the place where my time was completely capped out, I knew that I had to make some changes in my day-to-day life to get help with my child so I could keep growing the business. And so if that meant that, you know, I cut back on going out to dinners with friends, or maybe I didn't get, you know, Starbucks every day or whatever that was, so I could rebudget and have the money that was necessary to get childcare, then that's what I did. And so the beginning stages of that was a lot of, taking it day by day and really getting clear and intentional on how can I feel fully supported right now in this moment? What does that look like? Uh, What is really essential right now versus not? And and getting really clear on that in terms of how that was going to help me with my growth journey. And I think that that those small steps in the beginning really paved a really strong foundation as I continued to grow, because then I wouldn't be so afraid as I continued to build to hire help when I needed it or to, you know, set really clear boundaries about my, my day and when I can be available to to work, you know, I still have really small children. And so when they typically get home around four o'clock during the day, I have to be able to, to, to end the day, at least until they go to bed at night. And if I choose to work again, I can, but it was a lot of those day-to-day things of really finding the flow. And, um, I also work from home. So that's another dynamic to it as well of, you know, needing the house quiet and how do I work with, you know, our support system to make sure that I have the quiet time when I need it and really figuring out, you know, when do I tend to be at my peak performance throughout the day? And I think just more learning about, how you work and how you really achieve your goals and how you handle tasks versus um, what can happen a lot of times is we just get inundated with busyness and then we end up not doing anything. And so that's really helped. And then just having a really clear schedule that each day, like I have certain days out of the week that I do calls and I only do calls on that like one day, which is today. And so it, it frees me up for the rest of the week to be able to do other things that I need to do. And then for also for life's moments to just happen. And so I I try to, um, 
to have flexibility with that, but then also give myself a structure and a discipline. I am really someone who thrives on discipline. And for some reason along the way, I think that people just started to equate discipline as this restriction of like, I can't be as creative or I can't be in my flow if I'm too disciplined, but it's actually Mm -hmm. the discipline that gives you the flow to be creative. And the more disciplined you are, the more you can create, the more you can step into what you do, the more that you, you have flexibility to be creative emotionally, financially, you know, with everything. And so really fine tuning what that discipline is for you and, and honoring that and owning that I think is huge. Absolutely. Yeah. I 100% agree. And even with my audience being filled with so many amazing neurodivergent peeps, you know, we have these very creative brains, you know, I, I have a, my whole family basically has ADD, (laughs) you know, like I get it. I get how hard it is to have a schedule sometimes, but I can tell you for sure, like raising neurodiverse kids, that was very important for them as well. And so even if you think a schedule is too restrictive for you. I do invite you to try it at least, at least modify it in a way that might work for you and your brain, because especially as moms, it is so easy to just feel like we have to, like Julie was saying, take on every single thing that comes along, especially as you're in the newer phases of building your business. And you feel like you just got to take everything on because you, you know, quote unquote, need it. Well, it's really important too to step back from that and really decide how much of yourself you're, you're really willing to give away on the daily. And my schedule is, is very similar. I, I can only extrovert so much, (laughs) you know, like I love, love doing this, but I could not do it five days a week all day long. Like Mm -hmm. that is just not who I am. And so that self-awareness of knowing who you are, understanding. That's why I feel like all of the mindset and and the woo comes in there is that helps you like human design and all of these different things that can help you really understand who you really are and what you're about and understanding your purpose. Once you really have clarity on those things, you can then really implement strategies that make sense for you and honor them and honor those boundaries. And that's one of the best gifts that you can give yourself as just a human being, not even a business owner. So I do invite you to at least try some things to see what works for you. And this has been amazing. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do want to ask you what's next for you because I've seen, you know, I've been following Julie for years. I started listening to her podcast way back when, when you basically first started, I was in her mastermind. Um, so I've seen this evolution of your business. You know, she's got courses, she's a a leader in the, the industry across the board. And now the book, the book is almost a year old, I think. Yeah. Yeah. This, this summer, right. Crazy. Crazy. Um, so sort of where are you right now with everything and, and what's next for, for Julie Solomon? Yeah. So I'm in this process of doing a lot of really kind of more back end, deep operational, not sexy, but much needed work. Um, my team and I are really getting back to the basics with some things because what's next for me and what I'm really calling in is more about the power of subtraction instead of addition And how can I create more space in my life and more flexibility and more freedom? I think that especially for the last like three years, um, well, really since I started my business, but I feel like the last three years between moving and in the midst of COVID and having a baby and writing a book and then marketing a book. It's just, I've been on this go, 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 go. And I'm really excited to get to a place where I can just have a little bit more space and whatever that means. Like to me, a clear schedule is like the birds chirping, like the angels coming down from the heavens. Like that, that to me is like everything is a clear schedule. Yes. And so I'm working on some things from a business standpoint to lay the groundwork to allow for that. And, um, and then I think that when that space comes, it gives us obviously more space to really drop in and to get, get quiet and to call in like, what, what is, where do we want to, to, to go to next? And so that's really where I'm at for the next, you know, 
little bit and then we'll see where that takes me. Yes. Speaking to my soul right there. I am absolutely 100% on board with that. And I feel like we don't, you know, really give ourselves enough grace for that sometimes, especially as women. And so maybe, maybe you needed to hear that too today, someone out there. So I love, I love that. You got to be able to create the space and give yourself that time to receive because it's real easy for me, I know, to, to like lean heavily into that masculine and just do and, you know, human design generator, work, work, work. And so it's really important for me to step back and evaluate, like, is this really a, is this a hell yes for me? Does this feel really good? Right. And if not, I'm going to create some space if, if it doesn't. So um, maybe somebody out there needed to hear that too. Cause I, I feel like that's a theme I've been, I've been hearing lately. So tell everybody where to find you, where, what's, what's the best place, their point of entry to your world. <laughs> yes. Um, so my website, juliesolomon.net is probably the best point of entry. Cause that way you can kind of dive into all the things, um, learn more about me and what I have to offer. Uh, the influencer podcast, you can listen wherever you love to listen to podcasts. Um, we drop a new episode every Wednesday and have been since 2017. So a lot of content to dive into there. Of course, my book, get what you want. You can get it wherever you love to listen to books or read them. And, uh, I tend to hang out the most on Instagram. So you can find me at Jules Solomon, J-U-L-S-S-O-L-O-M-O-N. Awesome. Yeah. And you guys get to hear her amazing voice with the audible, which is my favorite because I have the physical copy, but I ended up listening to yours instead because I really just, you know, I just love your voice and I just love hanging out with you. So thank you so much for love you too. bringing your beautiful energy here. <laughs> oh, thank you so you much soon. for having me. You're so welcome. Thank you. Okay. I told you. I told you it'd be great. And don't you just love listening to her? You should definitely listen to her book. I'm going to link to all of that in the show notes for you. Some of the takeaways I think from this episode are nobody's coming to save you. As much as we really wish that would happen, we really need to learn how to, you know, step in and market ourselves. We are the best person to market our art. Another takeaway would be Stop blaming the market and saturated markets and all of that. You've got to take control over your business and learn how to set yourself apart. There's a lot of strategies that we talk about how you can do that. And you're going to find proof of whatever you're looking for. And it's your daily decisions, your beliefs, and your habits that really are what set you up for success in life and in business. I hope you love this episode. I'd love to hear from you, as always. And let me know that feedback. Obviously, a review is what I'm asking for. You know I'm going to say it. But look, these reviews really help us little podcasters a lot. Um, it's a lot of work that goes into putting on these shows, and I love doing it. But without the feedback, it's kind of like I'm talking into the void. So let me hear it, guys. Give me some feedback over in the reviews. Once a month, I'm going to go through and choose somebody and give away an Audible book, and it might be Julie's. So I hope you love the show, and um, I hope you have a really awesome week. I'll see you next time.